Good morning, everyone. Uh, if you were here yesterday for our disease update, uh, welcome back. If you're here for the first time today, welcome. Uh, I'm Philip Roswell, I'm the SDSU Extension IPM Coordinator, um, and I do a lot of field research on insects. I work with Dr. Baron Horst, who is presenting today, um, and we do a lot of work in soybean. Um, so welcome to today's crop hour session, and thank you for joining us. Please feel free to ask a question at any time using that Q&A button that is at the bottom of your Zoom screen, um, or make comments in the chat as well. Um, and you can do that throughout the talk. Uh, if you have a question, please type it down and we'll get to that question uh, and we'll answer that at the end of the presentation. Um, also, at the end of the presentation, I will show a CCA credit uh, QR code um, in order to scan that code. And this is only if you need, you know, the, the credit. Uh, make sure you have the certified crop advisor app on your phone and then uh, use the option scan course code um, to scan that QR code. Uh, we will show that, that at the very end. Um, so, and if you have any any technical difficulties or whatever, um, please hit that raise hand button at the very bottom of the screen, right by the chat and Q&A buttons as well. Uh, so with that introduction, um, our speaker today is Dr. Varen Horst. He's our extension entomolo entomology specialist um, based out of Brookings, South Dakota. Uh, and he will be covering uh, soybean aphids and soybean gall midge in South Dakota, as well as some other uh, insect of interest uh, for 2023. Uh, so with that, I'll hand it off to Adam. All right, thanks, Phil. All And just to make sure, Phil, can you see the slides? Yes, I can. All right, thank you. Well, good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you for attending this morning. As you can see from the title, we're mainly going to be speaking about soybean aphids, which uh, maybe we haven't covered in depth for quite a while, and then also soybean gall midge, which I know we have talked about a lot in recent years. And I didn't put it on the title screen, but we're also going to be talking about some of those other insect pests that we may be seeing in 2023, uh, specifically those that we saw in uh, the last year or so and uh, continue to be an issue. So most of us know a lot about soybean aphids. They've been around since 2000. That was when they were first discovered in the U.S., and since then, they've just kind of been one of those pests that initially showed up every year and then started to be a lot of, uh, for a while, there seemed to be mainly an issue on odd years. And then have reached a point where we haven't really seen large populations for some time. However, last year, we had hot spots uh, that showed up over here on the eastern side of the state where they were a problem. And I know a lot of management took place, especially in Brookings County and kind of uh, the surrounding areas uh, from here. But uh, that's just one of those insect pests, though, that it, we've, we think it's kind of reached equilibrium. That is, the pest populations, instead of seeing these large peaks, we've more or less reached where we'll have some small populations show up, but a lot of those natural enemies, the lady beetles, the other predators, seem to take care of them to some extent. So if you're not familiar with the soybean aphid, they're a small green insect, and uh, they are quite small. So you can see from this picture here, there's quite a few right here on the stem, and uh, there are winged and wingless stages, so they show up in our soybean as a wing stage, and those lay live, uh, essentially clones of themselves, and then those will reproduce. And one of the things with soybean aphids is uh, they're a very unique insect in that they uh, do not lay eggs. When they're on soybean, they're actually laying live nymphs, uh, so live young. And that allows them to have very rapid reproduction and also the fact that they produce so many of those nymphs uh, with each generation. So another thing with soybean aphids is they're not just found on one part of the plant. So in this picture, you see them on the stems. They can be found on the other underside of the leaves. We typically don't see them on the top of the leaves unless the infestations are really heavy. And a lot of times there are other symptoms present at that time, especially if we are familiar with that, the sooty mold where the leaves start to turn black because of the honeydew that the aphids secrete, uh, allowing mold growth and uh, also maybe the presence of other insects such as ants, which actually may be tending the aphids a lot of 
a lot of times it's referred to as they uh, milk the aphids and kind of tend them like we would tend cows uh, for milk because the ants are uh, consuming that honeydew. So as I mentioned, these arrived in 2000 and they were first found in Wisconsin and then they rapidly spread uh, from there. And so as we see here on this map, the initial uh, 2000 areas are in red and then everything after that uh, was 2001 to 2009. And I'm from this part of Iowa and I can remember the first time we found soybean aphids in our soybean. I was in high school. It was uh, we were out scouting for weeds, and we came across thousands of these small insects on the plants that were sticky, and uh, you know triggered an insecticide application pretty quickly because there were so many. And after doing a little digging on what it was and the thresholds, we knew that it needed to be taken care of. Soybean aphids, if left unmanaged during a year where they're really booming can reduce yields by as much as 40 percent. Uh, we've seen in trials where we have cages, we can actually kill the plants. So if there are no uh, none of those environmental factors such as the natural enemies or if it's a dry spell and we don't have those pathogens which would sometimes show up after a rain to reduce the aphid populations, they can actually kill the plants uh, if the populations are high enough. And these have been primarily managed using foliar insecticides. Now, there's been a lot of work on host plant resistance for soybean aphids, but uh, there are a few varieties that are out there with single genes, but there's still a lot of work to be done in that area. Host plant resistance works really well, and hopefully we see more of that being available in the future for this pest, because the nice thing about it is a year like last year, uh, in 2022, and we did have some flare-ups, if we would have had the resistance out in the field, there'd be a likelihood that a lot of those fields would not have needed any insecticide applications because the host plant resistance works quite well. One of the interesting things about soybean aphids is they were really the first really significant pests we had in soybean. I know we've had bean leaf beetles, we have a few other defoliators, but this map, or graph here, sorry, estimates the use in millions of pounds of insecticide by crop. And uh, what we see here is that up until about 2004, soybean aphids in 1997 had a hot year that is likely due to some defoliating insects, but soybeans are the green color here. And we see that about 2004 on, a lot of insecticides were being applied to soybean. And this map, or sorry, again, this graph stops at 2014 but if we cont continued looking at that going out, it probably continued to look pretty similar. Maybe it started to decrease a little bit, though, uh, in the last couple of years, just because the soybean aphids weren't as much of an issue. But since that 2000 arrival, our primary management tool for these pests have been foliar insecticides. And of those, we've almost exclusively used pyrethroids. And of those, it was typically lambda cyhalothrin. We also use some other insecticides, but not to the extent of the pyrethroids. A lot of that was the, the cost of a pyrethroid is much less than some of these other options. Another thing that came up over the years was sometimes a lot of applications had to be put onto the field because the soybean aphids either weren't completely removed or in some cases they actually came into the field again. So a neighboring population reached the, the limit where the winged form started taking off and so you'd get a reinfestation. And a first sign that maybe some problems were on the horizon for us with soybean aphids was that in Minnesota in 2012, they detected insecticide resistant spider mites. And 2012 was a very dry year, so spider mites were uh, major problem. And when that went out, people went out to treat them, they noticed they weren't having a lot of impact. And so the theory and what happened here is that soybean aphids were treated so uh, regular, rigorously there for several years up till 2012. And spider mites were probably in those fields to some extent. We probably had low dose exposure to spider mites and in time they became resistant to the insecticides. First cases of insecticide resistance for soybean aphids were in 2015. They showed up in Minnesota, indicated by these red counties. And so these were tested and confirmed in the lab. They found that reapplication of the insecticide had no impact. And 
uh, the individuals, like I said, were collected, tested in the lab, and determined to be resistant. So we jumped to 2016. Minnesota, again, had an issue where they were detecting these resistant populations, and then Iowa had one county where they detected an issue. In 2017, we really didn't have large aphid populations here in South Dakota. So you can see on the map here, most of our soybean aphids were up in North Dakota and Northern Minnesota, though there were still some down in the Southern counties. But we detected resistance here at each of the research farms. We put an insecticide trial out and we detected that populations weren't responding to the pyrethra insecticides. And then they were also detecting that in the populations in uh, North Dakota and then also these newer counties up in Minnesota. So in 2018, we participated in a study where we went out and collected aphids and tested them using these small vials. And the orange here indicates the 2017 tests. And then the red indicates counties that we sampled in 2018 that had resistant populations. And so one of the things I want to point out that is that in 2018, we actually did not have large soybean aphid populations in the field. And so I had a graduate student at the time who went out and he he really had to search for any aphids. And when he found some, he'd bring back the small samples from the field. Typically, it was a single leaf with a few aphids. And we'd rear those up in the greenhouse and run one at a time so that we didn't have any exposure from one colony to another and maybe clouding the results. But what we found was that almost every county we tested from those populations had some resistance, except for Minor County. And we tested a couple of populations from there and they were both susceptible. And that's actually really good news because if everything we tested would have been resistant, that would mean that this is very widespread. Every aphid we tested came from a population that had resistance, but there are still some aphids out there. And hopefully these numbers have been building based on how aphids reproduce. Hopefully, if we do this again in the near future, we'll see some more susceptible populations out there. But it is something to keep in mind, though, that there are these pyrethroid-resistant soybean aphid populations out in the field. And so, as I mentioned, in 2022, we had some breakout populations. And it's really difficult at this point in time to say that, yes, we're going to have soybean aphid problems going into 2023. But the best thing we can do is be prepared. And so we typically monitor, we always find a few on the research farms, but most of the time they're what we call a founder population. They're, they're attempting to establish and we'll go back. We know what area in the field they were in and we won't be able to find them again. And a lot of that has to do with those natural enemies and just other environmental factors that can limit their population growth. But since we do need to keep uh, fresh on how to scout for soybean aphids and what the recommendations are, for scouting for soybean aphids, there's two methods that we recommend. The first is you either go out and, uh, and you scout 20 plants. So it's about 100 plants per field. And each of those areas within the field where you're scouting those plants, you're looking for if aphids are present. If they are present, you count the number present on each of the plants that you're examining and determine if there are more than 250 aphids on those plants. And then you manage when 80% of the plants have 250 aphids or more on them. One of the issues with this, I can speak from experience because this is the method we used in graduate school when we were doing our research projects. This is extremely time intensive. Uh, so you can spend hours in one field counting these aphids. And we typically don't say to keep counting past the 250 mark, but even counting 250, 100 times within one field and having to walk around the field can take some time. So the alternative method for soybean aphid scouting, which is quite a bit uh, quicker, and if you have a lot of fields to scout, the recommended option is speed scouting. This was developed quite a few years ago, and it was tested to make sure that it was still relevant to that 250 aphid threshold that it is. The other nice thing is we have a worksheet for it. This was developed, and we have this available on our extension website in one of our articles. You can also find it other places on the web if you type speed scouting for soybean aphid. But the other nice thing is it if you haven't scouted for aphids for a while, it gives you the directions for how to do this. And so the initial thing you do is you go out and you scout 11 plants throughout the field. And you, you don't count all 11 plants right in the same row. You try to spread out a little bit, make sure that you're not looking all in one area. 
because sometimes we'll get these hot spots within the field. It's important to make sure you look at the entire field. But then for those 11 plants, you're counting. And if it's less than 40 aphids on the entire plant, you put a minus sign on your line here for that plant. If it's more than 40 aphids or 40 aphids, you stop counting. Hopefully you stop right at 40. Sometimes you can see uh, that there's far more than 40, but you put a plus. And then you do that for the rest of these. It recommends you walk 30 rows or paces from where you're at to the next one. If you get to for that first line, you tally up, you put how many of those pluses you had here. If you had six or less pluses for that first sample, you do not treat, you can come back to the field in seven to 10 days to recheck. If you had seven to 10, you continue sampling, you look at five more plants and you put them on the next line. And then you add together your two boxes. So you figure out how many total plants you've had. For that first one, if you're at 11, so every plant had 40 aphids, or more on it, you treat, but you actually come back and make sure in three to four days, you still come up with 11 positives. If you didn't quite reach that and you had to do a few more plants, you treat if you had 15 or more, but again, you come back in three to four days just to make sure before the treatment goes on. Uh, and one of the reasons we say three to four days is this gives you about a week uh, window. And I know that there is some difficulty uh, when the spray planes are busy and the sprayers are busy. It's hard to wait three to four days, but uh, do try to re-scout those. And so you just continue doing this until you either come up with, uh, if you, you're right on the border, you get all the way down here on this last line. If you're at 22 or less, you don't treat. Uh, and if you're 23 to 26, you stop sampling because you're just right on the cusp. So you come back in a couple of days and then you resample. And if you're at 27 or more total positives, in your treat. And so there was an app uh, for speed scouting from Nebraska, and I, I haven't had any success using that. I think it needs an update uh, on the, the server side. And so uh, for now, the worksheet's the best. And it honestly is also nice because then you can keep these in a binder and you have a record of what's going on for each field. So the management recommendations and the speed scoutings based off this is the economic threshold for soybean aphids, which we still go with is 250 aphids per plant. And that 250 gives you about a seven day window before you're going to breach an economic injury level. Uh, the economic injury level that was calculated back in 2007 is 674 aphids per plant before you actually can detect economic damage. And then I put it in here, the economic boundary level, because we get a lot of questions because things have changed since 2007. Prices uh, for the application have changed, the insecticides, as well as the commodity price. But the economic boundary level is where we actually can first detect yield loss. And before we've reached 485 aphids per plant, we don't see any yield loss. And then until we get to that 674, we aren't noticing significant yield loss where we're actually going to notice that we are having reductions in yield. And so one of the other things I get asked a lot about soybean aphids is when do we stop spraying or when, when are we past when the soybean aphids are going to have a lot of impact on the crop? And the thresholds are valid until we reach R6. So that's when you have pods on one of the top four nodes that have full green seeds. So they fill the pod. Once you get to R6, we typically don't see a benefit. Uh, because the seeds have developed, they are going to be what they're going to be. And so if we spray after that, we probably aren't going to have any benefit or not much benefit at all. So, uh, you know, it just depends on a given year when we're reaching our six. It seems like in the last few years when soybean aphids are showing up, they're showing up mid to late August. And that actually a lot of times corresponds with when we're getting very close to that R6 stage. And so it comes down to determining where you're at with the number of aphids per plant and where your plant growth stage is to make that decision to spray. I typically lean towards uh, being a little bit more conservative with the application because uh, until you know that you have aphids throughout the field and you aren't quite at that R6, a lot of times uh, from the standpoint of the other insects that are out in the field, we may not reach that real quickly. So for management recommendations in South Dakota, one of the things we've been recommending is looking at other insecticides besides pyrethroids, especially avoiding bifenthrin for active ingredients and lambda cyhalothrin. 
Another big thing is that we recommend avoiding prophylactic applications. And that's where you go out and spray before you actually have a threshold level population out in the field. When we do this, a lot of times we're actually potentially leading to having a resurgence of the insect population in the field. So we sprayed, but we actually just knocked out the natural enemies, the lady beetles, the other insects that would eat the aphids, and the aphid populations can take off freely. And another big thing is don't use the same insecticide class twice in one season. Now, my slides uh, are missing one small thing, and that's that we lost one of our major insecticides for soybean aphid management uh, back in 20, well, the end of 2021 into 2022, and that was Lorsban. And so chlorpyrifos, the active ingredient there, uh, the tolerances for it, food tolerances have been revoked, and that means you can't use it in soybean. And so that was kind of an option we would recommend maybe going to if we had a pyrethroid issue. But there are some other chemicals, and we have our new pest management uh, guides out for soybean, and I'd recommend perusing those for insecticide options if soybean aphids would become a problem in 2023. So we're going to move on from soybean aphids to our next pest. And if you're familiar with it, you probably have seen fields where the field edges look like this picture or we have dying plants going along the entire border of the field. And the culprit for this is soybean gall midge. And in a severe infestation, this is exactly what we see. We see that the edge starts sometime in July, end of June, early July, we start to see a few dying plants. And then eventually the entire edge dies and then those dying plants continue to move into the field. One of the other things I wanna point out here is that this soybean field is next to a cornfield. This was soybeans the year prior. That's going to be important. So the culprit here is soybean gall midge, and the larvae are small, very small. They're legless. They're underneath the epidermis of the soybean, and they're going to be feeding on the plant. And typically, this is down at the base of the plant. And to our knowledge, there are three larval instars, and they differ in size as well as color. So the first are clear, then they second are a little bit larger, they start to get some color and the last instar is kind of a bright orange to pink. The adults are much harder to find uh, during an infestation than the larvae. We use cages to try to track their emergence out of the uh, last year's soybean field, but they're about a quarter of an inch long from the tip of the front leg to the tip of the back leg. They have orange abdomens, which we can't see here. One of the big characteristics is they typically will rest with their legs out. And when they do, you'll notice that they have an alternating pattern of a darker band with a lighter band that starts off as brown and eventually almost gets to a tan or white color. And they have one pair of wings and they aren't extremely active flyers. And so that's another major key is a lot of times they'll just be hanging out on the lower leaves of the plant. So in, initially at the beginning of the season after the soybeans have emerged, if you start to notice wilting and dying plants, that's what this uh, pest will look like. And so we don't actually see them on the outside of the plant because they're down under the epidermis. This picture is a great, great highlight of the where they come from, though, because you can see the corn stalks here. And then here's where we start to see dying plants. So early season, we recommend looking for wilting plants. We also stress and recommend looking for discolored stems. Uh, there is going to be a little bit of stem swelling early in the season, but it is somewhat hard to detect. And then another big indicator is dead plants on the edge of the field. And so our collaborators down in Nebraska shared these images with us uh, just to make it a little bit easier to imagine what this looks like. So if you look in some of these pictures, it's not always 100% death on the edge of the field, but we'll notice that there are dead patches or the patches seem to be extending a little bit more each week. That's an indication of a soybean gall midge infestation. Initially, soybean gall midge were attributed, uh, the, the symptoms were attributed to disease, a lot of other factors, and eventually we determined that it was actually an insect causing this problem. And so I mentioned there's a little bit of swelling present on the soybean plant, and this is that little bit of swelling. And maybe you have to look at a few thousand infested plants before you start to see it, but it is there, it is somewhat slight. And uh, if we look at that plant right in this area, almost 100% of the time, we'll find a soybean gall midge larvae or a colony of them. So one of the things we think happens because the 
the female flies can't actually lay their eggs through the epidermis. They don't have the uh, ovipositor capable of cutting through a soybean epidermis. We think they look for openings. And we've seen that with hail injuries and simulated hailstone injuries where they actually will make their way into the plant in those areas where there's a wound. Well, a lot of our soybean varieties will actually split down at the base of the stem early in the season due to rapid growth. And that's also where we typically find the soybean gall midge. And so this discoloration here is also a lot of times right in that little bit of a swelling here. We see the discoloration and almost always will lead to finding soybean gall midge. So the best way to scout for these is to split it open. We'll see that there's a little bit of discoloration underneath the epidermis. I don't think you can see it in my picture here, but there were soybean gall midge in that stem. This picture highlights it a little bit easier so you can see what that looks like. Uh, so when we find that discoloration, a little bit of swelling, typically it will go up and maybe a little bit down from that point, but we'll find all of these orange and also the, the clear and the lighter colored larva. Well, also I should point out, notice that the, the stem has become woody. Uh, they typically, it's not the nice healthy looking stem. It'll become woody. There'll be discolorations on it. The epidermis will be discolored as well. And so aside from killing a few plants, the other reason we care so much uh, is that they can cause quite a bit of yield loss. On the field edges, they can uh, reduce yields by 10 to 100%. We've seen that go in as far as a couple hundred feet. In entire field averages, we've seen reductions in the 10 to 50% range where we were looking at the previous uh, soybean yield in that field. And so I know it's not a perfect comparison, but then we are looking at the current soybean yield uh, and that was the field average. And, uh, you know, these maps, though, uh, yield maps show a pretty good indication of where that soybean gall midge hits the hardest. One of the things I want to point out, though, as we've been scouting more and more for soybean gall midge, we can find it anywhere in the field. And so the edges seem to get hit the hardest, but we're estimating that there is some reductions even as we move into the field. And I apologize, Scott, I just noticed that there's some uh, questions here. So I'll address those probably at the end of the talk. I'll just answer all of the questions that as, as they come up at the end of the talk. So uh, the big problem with soybean gall midge is that before 2011, there were no, no reports of this pest in the Midwest. In Nebraska, they saw it for the first time in 2011. I started in South Dakota in 2015, and this is one of my first calls to the field. The big thing that I want to note is that these first two observations of the pest uh, indicated that it wasn't the cause of the plant's distress. Uh, there was other disease actually occurring in the field. The gall midge looked like they were feeding on a, a saprophytic fungus that was just present in these wounds. Uh, jumped forward a couple years and it became evident that now the soybean gall midge was actually causing problems uh, that di were different from what we were initially seeing in the field. And so we've also found that this overwinters as larva in the soil of previously infested fields. So if you had soybean gall midge in 2022, in 2023, those populations that are going to be emerging are coming from the 2022 fields. And it is a brand new species that's only been reported in the Midwest. So this was back in 2018. Uh, researchers just went through, specialists on these small flies went through and determined that it has not been described anywhere else in the, the world, not just in the U.S., but the world, which is very unusual because most of our soybean aphids can be traced back to where soybean originates from. We know that it also emerges in the spring, but we haven't figured out if there's a temperature threshold or what really triggers that emergence other than we know that it typically starts sometime in the end of May and into June, and seems to then continue for pretty much the rest of the season. So at this point, uh, we, there's 145 confirmed counties in five states. We don't have the 22 and 2022 numbers up on this yet. Uh, so it's actually quite a bit more. We found it in quite a few more counties in 2022. One of the things we do, I mentioned, is we monitor for soybean gall midge emergence, and there's even a network where you can get alerts for when the soybean gall midge is occurring, emergence is occurring in your area. And so we use these modified corn rootworm cages, emergence cages, uh, where the flies emerge out of the soil. We put quite a few of these out in a the field. They go up into this cup, and once they're in the cup, we can identify, count and identify how many are emerging. We check these on a weekly basis. Uh, 
and they're put into last year's soybean fields. So they're put into soybean stubble. And this is what those adults look like. You can see the orange abdomens a little bit better here, but this is what they look like when they're in the jars. It makes it pretty easy to identify what they are. So just to go through some pictures to kind of highlight the biology of these. So if this is this year's cornfield, last year's soybean, that's where they're going to be emerging. They're down in the soil. And one of the key things with this is they can cross pretty much any boundary. We found them pretty far from uh, last year's soybean. Seems like they can move pretty far in general. But uh, something else that this shows, we don't have the 2022 numbers in here yet. This is from Nebraska. But emergence varies a little bit, but it's typically in the end of May into June. In South Dakota, we tend to be more in that June range, probably just the fact that uh, our soils uh, stay a little bit cooler longer than down south. And so the duration of emergence varies a little bit. And as we see, in, initially we estimated around 15 days, 2022, 25 days, then 36 days, max 44, so about a month. Uh, I think the last thing we saw was that we still have, though, from this year's crop, it's not a single generation. Seems like there's a couple generations within the field. Uh, so for South Dakota, the infestations tend to be much worse in our southern counties. and our Infestations can range from an obvious plant death when there's a severe population present to the plant being pretty much asymptomatic, uh, but we can find the pests there. So this map is just for South Dakota, and we added in, Phil added in the locations where we detected it in 2022. McCook County bothered us for quite some time. Uh, it, we had found soybean gall midge all around it. We could not find soybean gall midge in McCook County. Uh, Phil found it this year, though. Uh, so uh, as you can see, it's spread out a little bit. And uh, one of the things we saw back in last year was we hadn't found it really in these uh, counties to the closer to the river until last year, uh, or 2020, I apologize. But we think that one of the factors that might have influenced this was that Hyde County had a lot of rain in the spring of 2020 and then Galmage showed up. And so it's one of those things we're still trying to figure out all the factors that lead to the infestations and we aren't positive yet, but it seems like there are some things that might encourage the populations more. As we get later into the season, uh, one of the other issues with this pest I'll mention is that the stems become very brittle and just walking alongside of them will cause the stems to break and it'll sound like you're snapping twigs. Uh, where this is really severe, even a deer running through the field will just completely demolish sections of the field because the stems are so brittle. So for soybean, our scouting recommendations is to focus on fields that are near previously infested soybean fields. Also, soybean that are being grown near uh, groves or shelter belts, we think that these are acting as barriers for the adults. And so the wind deposits them in those areas. Uh, a lot of times we see that the infestations are much higher. There might also be uh, some other factors leading to this, but we think wind might play a part. We've also seen in South Dakota that earlier plants of soybean uh, tend to have a higher infestation and also uh, soybean that are planted at lower populations, which kind of goes up against a lot of the stuff we've been talking about for the last about seven, five to seven years about planting earlier. Uh, reduce planting rates. But one of the things we see is these do like larger stems. And so that's why the, the higher planting populations might reduce uh, infestation a little bit. We've seen that most treatments we've tested, seed treatments and uh, a lot of the foliar treatments have had some variable effect. Uh, most of the seed treatments haven't had much success at all. Nebraska, and I'll show some graphs here, has seen a lot of benefit with ridge tillage early in the spring. So cultivating, uh, throwing the soil up against the base of those uh, splitting stems can prevent the flies from laying their eggs there. Late planted soybean in South Dakota tends to be less infested. We've noticed that during the years when it's really dry, we, we tend to have reduced infestations. So uh, that might be due to slower plant growth too. We aren't, we aren't sure at this point in time. But Here's uh, some information on that ridge tilling or hilling. And one of the things that I have to mention is I visited with Justin out of Nebraska, uh, Justin McMeckin. 
they have to go pretty slow uh, when they're doing this because as you can see here, the soybeans are very small. Those stems are very uh, small. And if you're throwing the dirt too fast, you're probably just going to demolish the plants. So not saying this is the silver bullet to soybean gall midge, but this graph here shows uh, the total number of the soybean gall midge. And then this shows what stage they were at, orange or white, and then the total and total infested. So no hilling here. So no cultivation is in yellow. And then the cultivation is in blue. And what you see here is across the board, there's a reduction in the infestation. And the percent infested is way lower for when we have this hilling. And we think it's mainly because the flies can't find those uh, areas where the plant's wounded due to the rapid growth. Uh, so simply by covering up, we can prevent the fly from finding it and reduce the infestation. These pictures Justin provided here really show the stark difference between their treatments. So this was hilled, this was hilled, and this wasn't. So this is in the same field where they did their uh, study a couple of years ago, and it really shows a clear difference. So that has such a huge impact, but in uh, talking with Justin, he said they were going with their uh, small cultivator. They were going about a mile per hour. Uh, so I know that this isn't going to translate well to large fields, but it is something we might continue looking at and see if we can't figure something out uh, to move this into actual production acres and also probably won't work, won't work great for those who no-till because uh, this is quite a disruption in the soil, but it is an option if you are using a tillage system uh, that might work. Something else they've seen uh, some work, they've done a little bit of work with and seen some success is uh, either using a granular T-band, so you're putting that insecticide instead of on the seed, it's in the row or right above the seed there. And so they've seen that by doing that, they can reduce uh, the infestations a little bit. Another thing that works pretty well uh, is using drop nozzles. So if you're not familiar, this is what the drop nozzle system looks like. The key here is that instead of doing a foliar application where we're just spraying the plant and most of the insecticides on the leaves, we're targeting it down towards the base of the stems. And that seems to, if we look here at the total larva per plant for the untreated, the drop nozzle or the foliar overhead, same insecticide, we see that the drop nozzle did have a reduction compared to both the untreated and the overhead. And the overhead and untreated were pretty much the same. And so these are things that are starting to come out with the soybean gall midge uh, as far as we're, we're learning some of these impacts. And hopefully we can get some of these recommendations out here in the near future. Something we have to be cautious about with the soybean gall midge, though, is that there is something that looks very similar to it, and it's the white mold gall midge. The big difference is the soybean gall midge will be present when there isn't white mold growing the white mold gall midge will only show up when there is white mold out in the field. And so uh, we, we use that to differentiate, make sure that we aren't falsely identifying populations. But uh, the white mold also typically, as you know, shows up during wetter years uh, when we have the canopies and there's moisture. But uh, the big difference is, is that we'll find these anywhere that the mold's growing. So even on the leaves, and we, we don't see the soybean gall midge uh, really anywhere but in the stem. So I'm going to finish today's talk up with a few other soybean pests uh, that we've been monitoring for and that we think we need to discuss. The first is Dectes stem borer. So there are a few areas in the Southeast uh, where we've confirmed this. They seem to be in those areas being uh, kind of ramping up. And so Dectes stem borer is not an unusual insect in South Dakota, but we primarily find it in our sunflower acres. Uh, so if it has the preference between the two, if the two crops are side by side, it will go for the sunflower instead of the soybean. But in the Southeast, we don't grow a lot of soybean. And so we typically are seeing this in the soybean stems. So if you notice you're having lodging or this plant seem to be wilting and dying, another thing to do is split the stems and look for uh, indicators that there's a larvae present in there, as you can see here. The adult of these are a gray beetle. They have very long antenna. A lot of times they're also called the long, longhorn stem borer uh, because of their long antenna. They emerge for about a month, which can make the management a little bit hard for these two because we can't go out and spray once and reduce the populations. 
Uh, there's been some success with using two applications and trying to time them perfectly. Uh, we don't have those recommendations in South Dakota, though, because we don't uh, routinely go through and manage for DECTI's stem bore. So in the last two years, uh, we've seen an increase in this. In 2021, there were small patches. In 2022, I had Phil go out and take a look. These were field-wide infestations. Big thing with DECTI stem bore is that you'll see about 10 to 15 percent yield loss just from the larvae being in the stem because it's slowing down the nutrient water flow towards the top of the plant. The other thing that it can do and that's the more significant of the two is that it can cause major lodging issues. And so about 19 percent of the plants will lodge if they're infested unless we have strong winds. So if we have a storm come through you can see as much as the entire field uh, that was infested go down. So for management really the top recommendations we have are crop rotation, which we know everybody's doing, or every almost everybody. We can till, which in some fields we know that they've been established as no-till, and then early harvest. There's been a little bit of work uh, looking at planting date in uh, sunflower to see if planting date can influence this, and typically earlier planting dates have higher infestations. And so we're hoping to look at this going into the uh, 2023 and do some research on DECTI stem bore. Uh, so we'll keep you everyone, we'll keep everyone posted on the results from that. Again, another insect that we watch for and grasshoppers on will be defoliators. We'll talk about management of those all together. Uh, so the last couple of years, we've had a lot of grasshopper population issues in South Dakota. As we head west, it becomes more of an issue. Also down in the southeast, certain areas in the southeast counties have had quite a large uh, population boom with uh, the grasshoppers in the last couple of years. The last few years have been pretty favorable. 2022 is less so because our frost was earlier, uh, but it's also been very dry for the last couple of years. And so in 2020, I know this isn't in the southeast, but give you guys an idea of what a large grasshopper population can do. Uh, we had plots here, a uh, field over here got sprayed, the grass died, it pushed the grasshoppers into our plots. And in a week, this is what happened to our plots. So one week they looked healthy and fine, and the next week they were gone. Uh, so you can't see it real well, but a lot of the places the heads were even chewed off. Uh, so they also moved into the soybean here and pretty much soybean were saved with the foliar insecticide spray because they, they went through our sunflower first. Uh, they were noticed in the sunflower, so the soybean got sprayed before they were totally destroyed. But uh, grasshoppers can cause a lot of defoliation damage really rapidly. They can also feed directly on the harvestable parts of the plants. So you see here at these two uh, striped grasshoppers, and so they can be a major issue as we move into the fall. So the prediction, though, for grasshoppers in 2023, we'll probably see some. We had an earlier frost, as I mentioned, but it was uh, probably not early enough to really reduce the populations. They still had quite a bit of time to lay eggs. So we'll probably, if it continues to be dry, see some populations explode in 2023. Uh, we'll monitor those spring conditions, though, uh, and... Hopefully, Laura Edwards will have some good news for us uh, as far as precipitation in the spring. But uh, right now, just looking at kind of the trend, we'll probably see areas where if grasshoppers were a problem last year, they'll probably still show up uh, in 2023. So the threshold for grasshoppers, uh, you can look at the number of the adults or nymphs out in the field. It's 8 to 14 adults per square yard. Uh, you can either actually take out... Uh, uh, kind of a square and throw it out in the field and estimate movement, or you can stand and estimate that area around yourself and just monitor for movement in 30 to 45 nips per square yard. A lot of these fields where we're talking about having far above threshold, you don't really need to do this for very long because uh, you can go up to about a thousand, or if the ground looks like it's crawling, uh, you're probably well above that threshold. With uh, corn, uh, and beans, we do worry about the grasshoppers feeding on, and corn I, met, I mentioned here, this is uh, the silks, but in soybean, we're worried about the pods. And so uh, pod feeding can happen with grasshoppers, and that'll open the pod up to other uh, potential infestation of diseases and can lead to uh, those infections occur 
uh, can cause some discoloration and other issues. So another defoliator we monitor for in soybean, these show up pretty regularly in South Dakota, are red-headed flea beetles. Uh, they're also one of those that show up in other crops, such as corn. In soybean, they leave these little window pane uh, defoliation marks uh, on the leaves. If you get enough of these, though, they can cause some problems. Another pest we watch for in South Dakota are beanleaf beetles. Now, if you look at our spring uh, article, it says that we should never have really have soybean or sorry, beanleaf beetles because our temperatures get pretty cold. We can do an estimate of mortality using the air temperatures throughout the winter, but uh, there is enough ground cover. And if we have snow cover, the insulation there that every year we have beanleaf beetles show up in the spring, that overwintering population. And then they'll also show up again uh, in the later summer. And so there can be a lot of variation in color with the beanleaf beetles. One of the key things, though, is they'll have this black triangle right here. A lot of times they'll also have these kind of rectangular markings on their bodies. Another pest we've started to see more in soybeans in South Dakota. We had it really before last year, are Japanese beetles. So when I was a graduate student at Iowa State, these were a major problem in central Iowa. Uh, caused a lot of defoliation damage in soybean. As you can see here, uh, we're starting to see some of those populations show up uh, in our soybeans. So they've been in the urban areas for a while now, but as they start to move into fields, uh, we'll continue to monitor, and they're another one of those defoliators that we'll watch for. So for all of these defoliating insect pests, we look at the thresholds. Uh, we look for leaf defoliation. And so you can see here, here's 20% and here's 30% defoliation. So quite a bit of uh, holes left in the leaves. Those are actually the thresholds. So 30% defoliation prior to flowering and then 20% defoliation after flowering. Uh, if we let this go, you can see somewhere between three to 6% yield loss. Uh, one of the things I always note though, is that even at 20 to 30% defoliation, this is the entire plant, not just one uh, trifoliate on the plant. If you look down uh, to the ground above those plants, you'll probably be able to see soil even at 20 and 30 percent defoliation. Soybeans are pretty hardy when it comes to defoliating insects, and they can recover pretty quickly. But it's also one of those things that's tough to watch. So we know that a lot of times uh, those pests are getting sprayed for. So that's all I have for content. I'll put these slides up for just a second, and then I'll answer the questions I see that are up there. And if you need to get a hold of me in the summer, uh, email is probably the best. I do have my office number here. We're typically out in the field, though, or scouting. Uh, but feel free to reach out. I also have a Twitter. I know I'm not the best with updating that in the winter, but I do try to put our articles uh, or just information on what insects we're seeing out in the field on there throughout the season. 